the Reverend Harold Francis Davidson, rector of the small Norfolk coastal village of Stiffkey for 25 years, was utterly besotted and bewitched by pretty young girls. Of that there is no doubt. How he behaved in the company of the numerous pretty girls he wanted to save was more up for debate. And in 1932 it seemed that the whole country, including the highest echelons of the Church of England, was debating exactly that. Every Sunday, Reverend Davidson was always at his pulpit at the Stiff Key Church. He then spent the rest of the week, however, in London, usually Soho, catching the first train every Monday morning and the last one back to Norfolk on Saturday night. It was said that the only time he spent the entire week in his parish was during the general strike of 1926. The Stiff Key locals joked that it was best not to die on a Monday morning as the body, especially in the summer, would be decomposing by the time the reverend made it back for the funeral. Wedding services were either deputized or the ceremony was held on a Sunday. Despite this, he was well liked by most of his parishioners. During the week, Davidson, often without his dog collar, would walk around the streets of the West End, essentially stalking and pursuing girls and young women wherever he went. Whether it was attractive young actresses, shop girls or waitresses, none of them were particularly safe from the glint in the reverend's eye. He always argued until the day he died that he was doing nothing but God's work, his aim in life, he claimed, was helping young women from falling into a life of prostitution, particularly shop assistants and tea shop waitresses, many of whom had left home for the first time and were on very low wages. It had all started in 1894 when Davidson was working as a comic actor in London. He had come from a long line of clergymen, but had always loved amateur dramatics at school and subsequently toured for several months with friends, performing as travelling entertainers. One evening, strolling along the Thames Embankment in a thick fog, he came across a weeping 16-year-old girl who was about to throw herself into the Thames. Davidson managed to persuade her against this action, and discovered that she had run away from home and was without funds or a roof over her head. He persuaded her to go back home with a letter from him to her mother, her pitiful story made a tremendous impression on me. I have ever since kept my eyes open for opportunities to help that kind of girl. During the first part of the 20th century and before the beginning of the First World War, however, most of Davidson's early work was with underprivileged boys in the East End. He helped set up the Newsboys Club to help out young London newsboys who were often badly treated and exploited by Fleet Street. These clubs were created so the young boys could get a meal and play games and generally be kept out of mischief. Davidson, along with others, helped the boys secure better wages and improve their working conditions. His work with young women, however, became more prominent after he returned home from war service as a naval chaplain and found out his wife had committed adultery and was pregnant. At his own estimation, Davidson had made the acquaintance, in one way or another, of two to three thousand girls between 1919 and 1932. I was picking up in this way roughly, as my diaries show, an average of about 150 to 200 girls a year, and taking them to restaurants for a meal and a talk. Of these I was definitely able to help into good jobs of work a very large number. When the Reverend talked about restaurants, 
he almost certainly was referring to cafes such as the J. Lyons Tea Shops, of which there were many around London in the 20s and 30s. The waitresses in the Lyons Tea Shops at the time were called nippies, and it was a nippy that was once involved in an incident with the ardent reverend. A friend of the Reverend, a certain J. Rowland Sales, remembered a time when they were having refreshments in a Coventry Street corner tea house between Piccadilly and Leicester Square. The Reverend had become visibly upset while telling a very sad story about a homeless couple he had recently found sleeping under a hedge in Norfolk. Suddenly his demeanour changed. It was almost like he was a completely different person, recounted Sales. A young, nippy waitress had just walked by and Davidson leapt to his feet and called out, Excuse me, miss, you must be the sister of Jessie Matthews, English actress at the time. He then promised the startled waitress that he would get her a part in a new play that was opening in London. Davidson, with the Bishop of Norwich's full support, had become the chaplain to the Actors' Church Union and he started using this as an excuse to appear backstage at various West End theatres. He became known as a voyeuristic pest and would often nudge open doors backstage. Oh, excuse me ladies, I didn't know this was your dressing room. Tales like these and other bizarre stories of the Reverend Davidson's behaviour around Soho eventually came to the notice of his employer, the Church of England. Excuse me, miss. You must be the sister of Jesse Matthews. A complaint was made via a handwritten letter to the Bishop of Norwich, the Right Reverend Bertram Pollock by a 17-year-old young woman called Barbara Harris. In 1931, the bishop decided to investigate Davidson, and soon the self-styled prostitute's padre was charged with five offences against public morality under the 1892 Clergy Discipline Act. He was to be tried in an ecclesiastical court used by the Church of England. A consistory court has no jury and is presided over in place of a judge by what is called a Chancellor of the Diocese. In Davidson's case, it was before F. Keppel North, the Chancellor of the Diocese of Norfolk. It was never revealed at the time, and most certainly should have been, that not only had Bishop Pollock and Chancellor North been to the same university together, but Mr. North was the godfather to the bishop's daughter. The court case was a sensation and front page news. It appeared the Reverend very much enjoyed the attention, and on the first day of the trial arrived in flamboyant style while smoking a characteristically large cigar. He even signed autographs. Amongst what seemed like dozens of nippies, theatre girls and domestic servants brought up to give evidence, the prosecution's star witness was a young woman called Barbara Harris, whom Davidson had befriended in 1930. He had first spotted her at Marble Arch, a popular haunt of prostitutes at the time, and he used his old tried and tested trick of comparing her to a famous actress, this time Greta Garbo. Barbara was just 16, but already a prostitute and suffering from gonorrhea. She had never known her father and had been abandoned by her mother who was suffering from mental illness. Barbara initially welcomed the kind gentleman's offer of help, 
and was soon pouring out her life story to the benevolent reverend, no doubt in the comfort of a familiar lion's cafe nearby. He helped her find lodgings and they became inseparable over the next 18 months. The reverend had given Barbara money and even found her a job in domestic service at Villiers Street in Charing Cross. But she quickly grew tired of menial work and the reverend's repeated attentions. At one point she gave him a black eye and threw coins at him, but he continually came back for more. One morning at 9am, Davidson had appeared at the room where she was sleeping. During the ongoing court case, the prosecution asked Barbara about this incident. You say you kissed him? Yes. How often was he kissing you? He was always kissing me. Did he ever ask you to do things? Oh yes, he once asked me to give myself to him body and soul. As the trial was coming to its end, it was thought that the evidence against Davidson would not be enough to find him guilty. That is, until the prosecutor, Roland Oliver, brought out two small photographs. To the Reverend's utter shock and horrified disbelief, one of the photographs was of the Reverend standing between an apodistra plant and a bare-bottomed teenage starlet. The girl was called Estelle Douglas and was the daughter of a close friend of his, an actress called May Douglas, whom he had helped to get on stage some 20 years before. May had asked Davidson to try and get her daughter into films. A photo shoot had been organized at the rectory with the idea of taking publicity shots of Estelle in her bathing suit. At one point, the photographer told Estelle that the strap of the bathing suit and her chemise were both showing, and allegedly out of earshot of the reverend, asked her to remove them, leaving her with only a black tasseled shawl to protect her modesty. A series of photographs were then taken. According to Davidson, the photographer offered £50 to take a photograph of him and Estelle with the intention of selling it to the newspapers. Davidson was completely broke and needed the money, and so he rather stupidly agreed to the request. Whether the photograph was set up or not, and there is much evidence to suggest that it was, it was the end for the prostitute's padre, and Chancellor North quickly found him guilty of five counts of immoral conduct. He was charged £8,205 in costs and was left in financial and professional ruin. The legal team representing the Reverend were let down by his eccentric antics. He performed a tap dance at one point in the witness box, and for some reason always refused to question the truthfulness or character of any of the prosecution witnesses, including Barbara Harris. The defense were also at fault for Davidson's conviction, however. Letters between Harold Davidson had been produced in court as evidence. Most of the letters from Davidson were signed your sincere friend and padre, while the relatively mundane letters from Harris were either thanking Davidson for his help or confirming an appointment with him. But Harris's original letter of complaint to the Bishop of Norwich was written in a completely different handwriting style. It was almost certainly written by someone else. Crucially, this wasn't noticed by the defense team. Another major mistake occurred when they failed to call Molly Davidson, the Reverend's wife, as a witness. She had always been completely aware of Davidson's charity work with young girls and generally had always supported him. She even often hosted sleepovers with the girls at the rectory in Stiff Key.
In October 1932, Davidson was summoned to appear in front of Bishop Pollock at Norwich Cathedral, where he was subjected to a humiliating and demeaning public defrocking. Removed, disposed and degraded, shouted a Daily Mirror headline. At one point, the bishop knelt in prayer and after a reference to our sentence duly passed, declared the office of Rector of Stiff Key and Morstan to be vacant. It appears to us, he said, that the Reverend Harold Francis Davidson has been found guilty in our consistory court of certain immoral conduct, immoral acts and immoral habits. We do hereby remove, dispose and degrade him. While the bishop and his procession were formed to leave the high altar, the loud, high-pitched voice of Davidson was heard again protesting his innocence. The bishop completely ignored him, and Davidson was left pleading his case in an increasingly hysterical voice as the clerical procession swept past him on their way out. Harold Davidson was not alone in criticising his prosecutors and the fairness of his trial. While most of the national press saw him as little more than a joke figure, the Church Times, no less, was more or less on the ex-rector's side. While they criticised Davidson's conduct as foolish and eccentric, they wrote in July 1932 that there can be no doubt that he was originally moved by a high Christian impulse and that he is still regarded by many as a champion of the outcast and the wretched. However necessary the proceedings may have been, the spirit in which they were conducted has shocked the public conscience. The secret inquiry agents, the characters of some of the unnecessary witnesses, and above all the photograph, made the trial both undignified and unchristian. The article also mentioned that under the Clergy Discipline Act of 1892, a clergyman could be found guilty from one single immoral act, and that it was therefore perfectly superfluous to bring forward numerous witnesses of doubtful character and to heap up a number of charges. Comparable to the Reverend and his zeal to rescue fallen young women was William Gladstone. The eminent Gladstone was often found wandering around the darker environs of the West End as he searched for young women to rescue, often asking them back to his house. Henry Le Boucher, MP for Northampton, noted that Gladstone seemed to prefer the young and pretty prostitutes, and Riley noted that he manages to combine his missionary meddling with a keen appreciation of a pretty face. He has never been known to rescue any of our East End whores, nor, for that matter, is it easy to contemplate his rescuing any ugly woman, and I am quite sure his convention of the Magdalene is of incomparable example of pulchritude with a superb figure and carriage. Ronald Blythe, in his book The Age of Illusion, published in 1964, wrote in one chapter of the Stiff Key Clerical Scandal, The Reverend Mr. Davidson's downfall was girls. Not a girl, not five or six girls even, not a hundred, but the entire tremulous universe of girlhood, shingled heads, clear cheeky eyes, Nifty legs, warm, blunt-fingered workaday hands, small, firm breasts, and most importantly, good, strong, healthy teeth besotted him. After the public humiliation at Norwich Cathedral, Harold Davidson picked himself up and started to use his youthful theatre experience. He turned himself into a travelling showman in order to attract as much publicity for his case as possible. He also desperately needed money. 
He wanted to appeal his court case and he believed he should have been tried by a jury. One infamous stunt involved him fasting inside a barrel at Blackpool. The container was fitted with an electric light and also a small chimney from which his cigar smoke could escape. Through a grill, he'd protest his innocence to anyone who would listen, and even invited Gandhi to meet him there for tea. Alas, to no avail. despite his stunts becoming more and more outrageous. At one point, he was being roasted in an oven while being prodded in the buttocks with a pitchfork by a mechanical devil. The erstwhile clergyman's fame was beginning to wane. In the summer of 1937, Davidson tried one more stunt, and at Thompson's amusement park in Skegness, he was billed as a modern Daniel in a lion's den. Davidson stood in a cage with a lion called Freddy and a lioness called Toto. Again, he shouted to any passerby about the injustice he had been dealt. This was merged, as usual, with a torrent of loud abuse against his former church leaders. On the 28th of July, Davidson accidentally stood on Toto's tail. The lioness's sudden movement made Freddy attack the former rector. The Daily Mirror described the attack. In a flash, the angry beast had torn open both the ex-rector's shoulders with its claws, and though Davidson bravely tried to strike with his stick, he crashed to the floor of the cage with the lion on top of him. It gripped him by the back with its jaws and began to maul him, while spectators screamed in horror. At this point, it was the turn of a 16-year-old girl to attempt to save Davidson. The young assistant lion tamer called Rene Summer picked up a whip and an iron bar and leapt into the cage. After raining blows on the lion with the whip, and when it lurched towards her on the attack, she rammed the iron bar into its jaws and then dragged Davidson across the cage and out of immediate danger. Davidson was taken to Skegness Cottage Hospital, fatally injured. It is said that the ex-reverend, always hungry for publicity to help his cause, and with blood pouring from his neck, still had the presence of mind to say, Telephone the London newspapers. We still have time to make the first editions. The owner of the amusement park, with rather indecent haste, put up a notice that said, See the lion that mauled and injured the rector. The next day he was asked to take the notice down, and then soon after the badly injured Davidson died of his horrific wounds. A verdict of misadventure was returned at the inquest. Davidson was buried in the Stiff Key churchyard, and with the help of the police to control the crowds, over 2,000 mourners attended the funeral. His epitaph reads, He was loved by the villagers who recognized his humanity and forgave him his transgressions. May he rest in peace. Well, my dear viewers, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. A bit of a change from vintage crime. Um, what did you think of the of the Reverend? I guess you will all have differing opinions. Some of you may think he was just a pervy old uh, vicar. 
Uh, he was that, but he was much more. He was uh, a, an eccentric. I mean, if he had just been a pervy vicar, he would have slunk off in shame uh, at the end of the court proceedings, but he, he was an actor, most assuredly an actor, and he, he loved to perform. Uh, he, he, he was never meant in that life to be, to be um, representing a church. <laughs> I just think it's, he's a classic, he really is, yeah. I want to show you this uh, image here on the screen now. It's Edith Sitwell's English Eccentrics. Uh, this is actually my book and was given to me uh, by a dear friend back in the 1980s. I still have it. It has been rebound and everything. It's fell apart. Uh, I've read it many times. Uh, the Reverend Davidson is not featured in her book, uh, but he is uh, truly an English eccentric. Um, I found uh, the tale utterly delightful. <laughs> it was... He's a classic. And by the way, I didn't uh, include all the uh, court proceedings. Uh, Barbara Harris's testimony. Uh, the the Reverend Davis uh, actually did m or attempted to do more than kiss her, and uh, she alleges performed an act of indecency several times while visiting her in her rooms. Then again, she might be lying. Who knows? But uh, without a doubt, the, the Reverend did have a keen eye for the young ladies. Um, and I found this. Uh, check this out. Yes, my dear viewers, you know, while researching uh, the images, um, you'll often find yourself wandering down some interesting pathways. Uh, you find uh, little bits of information here and there, uh, which leads you to find out a bit more about some of the characters. Not always, but... This time it certainly did. While I was re searching for images of Barbara Harris, the young model, uh, she of the coin throwing and the black eye giving, I found this article. It's quite amazing. Let us have a look at this. You see here, there's a portrait here of the artist's wife, Brenda Cole, previously known as Barbara Harris. What does it say here? For more than half a century, this portrait in Swindon Art Gallery has been simply titled Seated Figure and dated 1952 without reference to the extraordinary life of the sitter. It's possible the artist Leslie Cole was unaware of the scandalous background of the model even though she was his wife. The 24-year-old he married in 1938 called herself Brenda Harvey. This is his lithographic impression of her a year or so earlier. And here we can see the lithographic in the lithographic impression. Um, quite saucy, isn't it? And what else does it say? What the besotted suitor may have been unaware of is that she was not always called Brenda. When she was a teenager, she was known as Barbara Harris, a key witness in the downfall of Harold Davidson, the infamous prostitute's padre. And there we see Barbara in her heyday. Yeah. And um, we, we've been through all that during the presentation, but what's quite sad at the end is, uh, where does it say? You can pause and read that if you wish. There is the artist. Yeah, here we go. In peacetime, he and Brenda settled into a ramsackle home and studio near Chelsea Football Stadium, although Brenda became an accomplished potter. Without the stimulus of war, Leslie's career went into decline. Even so, 28 of his paintings, included seated figure, were shown at the Royal Academy. The couple were unable to have children, and in 1960, eight years after the Swindon Gallery portrait, Brenda had her left leg amputated after contracting cancer. That's very sad. Yeah. So, as, as I say, it's very interesting you find stuff that, uh, you know, is not presented when you're researching the story. Uh, I'm, I'm always interested in people and their lives. I, th I just thought I would, uh, I would share that with you, my viewers. Also, while researching this case, I came across this article here by the BBC News. Soho's historic Windmill Strip Club faces closure. Now, apparently, this, uh, this strip club has been around since the 1930s in Soho. So I was wondering, is it possible that the Reverend also frequented this establishment? I don't think we, we, we will never know for sure. Um, it just got me wondering, and I wanted to share this other delightful photo with you of, of the lady, uh, the madam, or 
who ran the establishment. I think that's a fantastic photo. And also, I would like to share this photo with you. Now, I found this um, in a friend's junk shop that he closed down about three years ago. Um, but I found that there and I purchased it from him. I think it's fantastic. Yes, uh, some of my viewers uh, are aware, some of you may not be aware, that I love collecting vintage photos, uh, I just, especially with people in them. Uh, and they're interesting, not just like you know the, the mundane, uh, the normal run-of-the-mill run family portraits they did. I'm talking about interesting scenes like this one um, that tell a story or or you have to make the story up. You have to imagine what's going on. I love that. And um, I'm an avid collector of, of such photos uh, like this one. Um, we will never know what this lady looks like. That's, that's the mystery. A, a bit like my voice, I guess. You, you don't know what I look like, but you hear the voice and you have to sort of make a picture in your mind. Um, but often you can look at the details and, and pick things out. The fact that uh, she's sweating uh, you can see her arm, armpits here are sweating. Either it's very hot in the, the establishment or she's very nervous about these old men, leer, these dirty old men leering at her. Or, or a bit of both, who knows. But um, yeah, as I say, I love these old photos and um, I have lots of them. I have lots of them. People interest me. I'm very interested in, in people, particularly, particularly vintage photos. Unlike paintings. I love paintings too, but paintings... Although they can try and be spontaneous, they are not. They are structured and they are built up uh, to try and capture what a moment would look like. Uh, whereas a photo actually captures a moment in time. That's why I love them so much. And uh, that's why photos nowadays are being recognized as art in themselves and are fetching high prices. Yes, um, could that be the reverend there in the audience? The grey-haired gentleman in the middle? Uh, gazing at this charming young lady disrobing <laughs> that's another thing we'll never know but it's a uh, it's interesting to think it might be um, probably not but there we go but look, I mean you can it must be about the 1930s judging by the lady's shoes and the wallpaper I don't know what club this is it's definitely London on the back of the photo it's a, it's a London um, media photograph I don't know what the occasion was I, I don't know what club it was unfortunately I'd love to find out but that would probably be impossible there were so many um, yeah strip clubs at that time or was there I'm sure there were I'm sure there was a lot that weren't publicly announced um, anyway I thought I thought I'd share that uh, that image with you one thing I can say for sure is that if the Reverend Davidson, or the ghost of Reverend Davidson, is, is still about and looking down, I'm sure he would be overjoyed that I've made a video about him. He loved publicity. Uh, he would be overjoyed to see the photo, too, of the stripper. Uh, yeah, he was that sort of character, wouldn't he? The, the more publicity, the better. Um, what did Oscar Wilde say? What was his quote again? He said something about, it's better to have people talking about you than not talking about you. Something like that. You can correct me if I'm slightly off with that. Um, and what about the bit about the one of the acts he did with him being roasted alive in an oven with a mechanical devil prodding his butt? I would love to have seen that. I would love to have seen at least a, a photo of it or an image, but sadly that appears to be lost to time. Uh... I'm just trying to conjure that image in my head. <laughs> oh my goodness. Tell me if you, my viewers, if you would like to hear about more uh, English eccentrics in the future. Because, yeah, I don't mind doing them. I, I think they're, they're great. Anyway, I'm going to head off now. This is uh, nudging over the 30 minutes. And, um, yeah, hope you enjoyed it. Love to hear your feedback. Uh, catch you next time, my dear viewers and loyal supporters. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.